My name is Ken Morris, and I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass. <laughs> and I'm also the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. <laughs> And I'm so honored to be with you this evening to commemorate and celebrate the bicentennial of my great ancestor, Frederick Douglass. And I'd like to thank Leader McCarthy and Cedric Richmond for bringing us together this evening so that we can talk about this great American hero. You know, when I introduce myself to people and I say I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, and the great-great-grandson of Booker T. Washington. Not only is it a mouthful trying to spit out all of those greats, <laughs> but it sometimes makes me feel far removed. And you may be sitting there having a hard time trying to imagine what our connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with all of those zeros. <laughs> but many people know or knew a grandparent and some of you may have even known a great-grandparent. Well, that's how close I feel to both of my ancestors. Because you see, my great-grandmother, Fanny Douglas, to whom I was very close, she lived to be 103 years old, and she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. And my Aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, she lived to be 95, and she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And I remember being a little boy and sitting on my great-grandmother Fanny Douglas's lap and she would tell me what it was like to know as she would call him the man with the great big white hair. And I remember sitting on my Aunt Portia's lap and she would give me first-hand stories about her father, Booker T. Washington. And one day when I was trying to wrap my mind around the distance between the generations, I had this thought that hands that actually touched the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touched the great Booker T. Washington also touched mine. So in a sense, even with all of those greats, I can say I stand just one person away from history. And I stand one person away from slavery. We're not that far removed from the history of slavery in this country. And as president of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, we have the honor and privilege to dialogue with tens of thousands of students around the country in the work that we do around anti-human trafficking with prevention, education, and training of educators. And when we have conversations with students, I think they sometimes tend to think, when they look at the great heroes and heroines in the history books, that they lived so long ago, and it's hard for them to imagine that they were living people that overcame struggle and obstacles and rose up to really benefit and help the lives of countless people. And so I want to focus just a few moments on a period of Frederick Douglass's life which really is at the foundation of the work that we do in education with young people and getting them to understand the importance of education and freeing themselves from mental bondage. And that was Frederick Douglass, as we heard, was born on the eastern shore of Maryland into slavery. He was born to a black woman who was enslaved and to a white man, and it was presumed that his master was his father. He never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was about seven years old. He used to sleep head first in an old corn sack with his feet hanging out on cold winter nights because that was the only way he could try and keep himself warm. And we heard earlier he only saw his mother about four times his whole life, and that's because she lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. For in order for her to see her son, she would have to work in the fields picking cotton from sunup to sundown walk 12 miles in the middle of the night and spend just a few precious moments with him until he would fall asleep. Around the age of seven or eight years old, he had something that he called divine providence in his favor happen. And that was he was chosen from among all of the slave children on the plantation to go to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's brother-in-law. And when he got there, his slave mistress, Sophia Auld, had never had a slave before. And she didn't know that it was illegal to teach young Frederick how to read and write, so she began to teach him his ABCs. But when his master found out about it, he got angry, and he forbade the teaching. And he looked at Frederick, and he looked at his wife, Sophia, and he said, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write, because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. And Frederick looked at his master, 
and he heard that message and he said, if you don't want me to have this, I'm going to do everything in my power to gain it. And he understood right then and there that knowledge is power and education would be his pathway to freedom. In honor of Frederick Douglass's bicentennial, Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives has published a special bicentennial edition of his narrative, his first autobiography, which was first published in 1845, that the Library of Congress named one of the 88 books that shaped America. And in the same way, when Frederick Douglass started to teach himself to read and write, he started to break free from mental bondage, and he became unfit to be enslaved. And he started to ask critical questions about his oppression and enslavement. And he would ask, God, do you mean for me to be a slave for life? Because my master puts on a suit every Sunday and goes to church, and in the Word, in the Bible, in cherry-pick verses, he finds justification to brutalize, dehumanize, exploit, rape, pillage, and plunder his property. And I can't wrap my mind around what I know is the pure, peaceable, impartial Christianity of Christ. And then he would ask questions like, why am I a slave? And why do you own me? You see, he's unfitting himself to be enslaved. So putting the words of Frederick Douglass in his classic autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, into the hands of one million students, which is our plan by the end of the bicentennial year, to di distribute this book, we want to inspire and empower the next generation of leaders with the words of Frederick Douglass. Being his descendant our whole life, we've had people of all ages and all races come up to us many times with tears in their eyes. Tears in their eyes because they were introduced to Frederick Douglass's words, and they always remember that they were in a certain grade or in college. What they want to say to us is thank you, thank you for inspiring me to be a leader in my church, my community, my school, my business. And so I know the impact that Frederick Douglass's words can have on our young people, so that we can get them to start thinking about institutions. So when Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery at the age of 20 and he settled in New Bedford, Massachusetts, he wasn't happy just to be in a free state and just to settle down and get married to our great-great-great-grandmother Anna Murray Douglass, but he looked back and he saw this legal institution of slavery. I mean, we face a lot of challenges now, but imagine what that must have looked like to say that your federal government said it's okay, it's legal to enslave you and illegal to teach you. Thank goodness for all of us that Frederick Douglass and the other great heroes and heroines did not turn away from that challenge or we would be a very different country than we are right now. And so with young people today, we want them to look at these institutions that in some cases where systemic racism runs rampant and where institutions conspire to keep poor and oppressed and people in communities of color down we want them in the same way to look and say, how do we go about changing things? How do we go about dismantling these institutions so we can be a better country, so that we can live up to the promises that have been afforded to us? The last time I was in this space was in 2013 when we dedicated this magnificent statue back here. And it's good to be back and to talk about Frederick Douglass and to think about this idea that history lives in all of us. It doesn't just live in me because I descend from two people that we've heard of, but history lives in each and every one of you. I had a 10-year-old girl say to me one time, she raised her hand and she said, Mr. Morris, I researched my family tree and I found that my great, 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 great grandmother was born into slavery she taught herself to read and write in secret, and then escaped, became a successful businesswoman and a philanthropist. And she said, so do you know what that means? And before I had a chance to respond, she said, it means I have greatness flowing through my veins just like you do. We all have greatness flowing through our veins and history lives in each of us, but the future depends on how we carry that forward. And with that, I want to thank leader Nancy Pelosi for appointing me to the Bicentennial Commission. I look forward to serving with the other commission members, and thank you all very much. God bless you all.